Hi folks and welcome back to Conveyancing. This is video two in the week two series on real estate agents and you'll see back in our Prezi that we have done in video one the appointment of the real estate agent and we had a little look at their duties and now we are covering off the last two topics. These can be dealt with fairly expeditiously because misleading or deceptive conduct and misrepresentation were dealt with very heavily in your contract law unit. So we will jump into misleading and deceptive conduct and misrep now. Um, I like this little graphic because uh, it's got that big fat dot on Australia and I guess on Queensland. Um, the Australian Consumer Law is our native uh, legislation dealing with misleading or deceptive conduct, as you are all only too painfully aware, having done contracts. And uh, it's extremely effective, one of the best uh, pieces of legislation of this kind in the world. So uh, really a very good piece of legislation to be dealing with here. Um, I am hoping that you are all intimately familiar with the legislation from your contract law unit. Um, it simplifies the common law of misrepresentation enormously um, and is very, very beneficial. I would even go out there on a limb and say not too many people really rely on the common law of misrepresentation nowadays unless you're kind of backed into a corner for some reason. Perhaps the ACL doesn't reach over and bite into the particular circumstances that you're dealing with. Um, if that's the case, well, you've got to work with the, uh, the common law beast of misrepresentation. Um, however, wherever you can, it's definitely worthwhile trying to slip things under the ACL. It's just so friendly to work with. In any event, um, in terms of misrepresentation, just to refresh your memory, let's have a little look at the elements once again. Sing along with me now. You can follow the bouncing ball if you like. There needs to be a false statement of past or existing fact made by the representor to the representee at or before the time the contract was entered, which was an inducing factor, not the or the sole inducing factor, but an inducing factor, uh, inducing entry into the contract. Um, that's good and vagalas there. Obviously, entry into the contract is your conduct that then shows that the representee has relied on the misrep, which links up the misrep to their loss that was suffered. So they are the elements you will recall that you are not even at common law restricted only to statements of past or existing fact. You can still sue for statements of opinion that were clearly wrong. Remember the Smith and Land and House Property Corporation case where the seller was saying that they they were selling the property with a most desirable tenant. Unfortunately, that was talking it up in the extreme. The tenant was uh, fairly laggardly in paying their rent instalments, uh, and obviously mm. the the court's not going to allow that kind of thing to slide by. So, if you guys do need a refresher of the um, details of the elements and various different cases that we looked at in contract, I'll put up the contract videos on the conveyancing page for you if you want to just go on happy times reminisce for a while you can go and have a look at those uh, one of the things that I guess you do need to be aware of as you saw on that previous slide um, the the ability even at common law for a seller to be vicariously liable for the misrepresentations of their agent that's one thing you've got to bear in mind um, obviously for misrepresentation the main remedy is rescission in terms of the ACL, the main points that you'll need to recall from your contract days is when and how the ACL bites onto conduct um, by individual persons. In particular, we're looking uh, for sellers that are selling their property and whether or not the comments or instructions that they've given to their agent might find them liable um, under the ACL. We need to bear in mind when an agent's um, misrepresentations and misleading and deceptive conduct are going to be sheeted home to their real estate company or their employer um, and when that employer will be liable and 
also when the seller will be pulled into the whole liability mess. Uh, the text is very good on this point, so I would um, I would encourage you to have a look at the uh, the prescribed text for this unit. But if you're in doubt, um, do go back to your contract text. As I said, I'll put the other contract videos up for you in case you want to look at things in a little bit more detail there. The main thing in relation to the ACL when you're talking about property matters and you're trying to pin some liability on a seller is that the ACL obviously will only reach to conduct that's in trade or commerce. So that's, I guess, your touchstone for analysis when you're talking about property matters and the ACL. Um, there's no good trying to pin uh, conduct on an individual if they're not going to get over that, uh, that old chestnut of a hurdle. Um, it's particularly important for agent representations. Silence um, it usually falls into that category as does opinion and uh, sometimes particularly where lots are being sold off the plan so there's a residential development about to happen. Uh, representations as to future matters crop up a fair bit. Uh, as I said I'm not going to labour this, um, there's plenty of resources for you to familiarise yourself with all of this. As I said at the beginning of the video you should already be painfully aware of all of this stuff and uh, so we can all move on. Now it's time to have a look at the deposit. Now in the most common scenario you will have the contract being concluded or formed and then you'll have the deposit being paid. The text does go into some discussion about what happens um, at law when a deposit is paid pre-contractually. Um, sometimes I find the authors of the text like to go off on merry excursions about you know, some fairly archaic things that um, don't necessarily get encountered terribly often. Um, if you're in interested, have a look at all that stuff. But generally speaking, in the vast majority of, of circumstances, you'll have the contract being executed first and most people won't hand over their money until the contract's been formed. Um, then what happens? Well, if there's a tussle and a dispute, uh, the rights are worked out in relation to the, the deposit according to whether the agent received the deposit as agent for the principal or as stakeholder. Okay, so where the real estate agent receives a deposit as agent for that principal, it means that they are effectively acting as their principal holding out their hand, taking that money. Once they grab hold of that money, it's as though their principal has also grabbed hold of that money. That means the money is then effectively in the hands of the principal, which is the seller. Okay, that means that once the agent, as agent, has received that deposit, that discharges the buyer's obligation to pay over the deposit and it's as if the seller has already received it. Okay, if something happens, things go wrong, um, the real estate agent goes insolvent or so on, the seller can't recover again from the buyer because it's as though the seller's already received the money. Uh, the buyer can recover from the seller because, again, it's as though the seller's received the money. So, uh, bit of a precarious situation there. Generally speaking nowadays, certainly under the standard contract, we have the agent being designated a stakeholder and that means that the stakeholder acts equally for the interests of the buyer and the seller and they're holding that money only on the occurrence up to the occurrence of a contingent event. Okay, both parties recourse in the event of something going wrong here is against the stakeholder, not against each other. Okay, so even if the stakeholder goes insolvent, the only action that either will have is against that stakeholder. They'll have to take a ticket, get in line behind all of the other creditors to the now bankrupt stakeholder. Okay, uh, they can, mm -hmm, the other alternative, look to recourse from the Fidelity Fund. Um, that is uh, certainly something that's probably preferable to taking a ticket and standing in line, uh, but that is the sorry situation there. So um, that is the party's situation um, in terms of the stakeholder.
In terms of investment, Part 2, Division 2 of the Agents Financial Administration Act is the act that you need to look at here. And 15, 16, 17 are the crucial ones. So you'll see 15 deals with what exact where in the terminology a deposit fits. So it says 16 and 17 apply if an amount is received by an agent for a transaction with a direction for its use. In this section, amount received by an agent includes the deposit there. You'll see in 2A, 15 2A. So you know that deposits fall within this division. 16, um, an agent must before the end of the first business day after receiving the amount, pay it to the agent's general trust account or if section 17 one applies, then go to 17. And under 17, uh, a property agent may invest an amount if they receive the amount for a sale and the sale is to be completed effectively on a day that's more than 60 days after the amount's received. So you can't uh, be paid a deposit as an agent uh, if settlement's going to be the next day, for example, and try and get one day's worth of interest. Okay, you, you have to do these things with enough time for the investment to ripen, so to speak, even 60 days is fairly short. Uh, so if the sale is to be completed on a day that's more than 60 days after the agent gets the deposit and the amount is received with a direction from all parties, all parties, both buyer and seller, to the sale that it be invested, then 17 sub 2, the agent must pay the amount as required uh, to a special trust account with a branch of a financial institution within the state operated for the investment of the amount. So you can't just stick the money anywhere that the agent wishes to stick it, so to speak. Hmm, it was rather inelegant, wasn't it? Um, you have to do it with a financial institution operated for investment for those amounts. Now, bear in mind that the standard terms and conditions in the REIQ house and land contract has something to say about this as well. And if you look at clauses 2.3 and 2.4, they're the relevant ones. They marry up with the legislation we've just had a look at. So 2.3, if the deposit holder is instructed by buyer and seller, and it's lawful to do so, well, yes it is, we just saw the legislation. The deposit holder has to invest as much of the deposit as has been paid. Remember that the deposit is often paid with an initial amount and then the rest of the, the deposit, the balance of the deposit. So the, the agent has to invest as much of the deposit as has been paid with any financial institution in an interest bearing account in the names of the parties. Now the legislation says it has to be that special trust account operated for these purposes. And the agent has to provide that financial institution with the party's tax file numbers. Okay, entitlement to the deposit and the interest is regulated by 2.4. The party entitled to receive the deposit is, if the contract settles, obviously, the seller. If the contract's terminated without default by the buyer, then the buyer. If the contract's terminated owing to the buyer's default, then the seller. The interest on the deposit has to be paid to the person entitled to the deposit. And three is just basically a reservation of rights. Uh, so if the contract's terminated and the buyer has no further claim once it receives the deposit and interest, so if the seller's done something wrong, the buyer's entitled to get their deposit back, uh, they get their deposit, they get the interest, they have no further claims against the seller unless uh, the termination's due to the seller's default or breach of warranty, in which case then you're going to be uh, claiming what? Mm -hmm. That's right, compensation or damages from the seller. So uh, obviously risk, well whoever's entitled to the deposit at the end of the day and the uh, interest on the deposit is uh, the one that bears the risk of investment. Okay, so that is the investment of deposit. In terms of um, the obligation to account for the monies. The agent obviously has to account for the deposit to the seller after settlement. So they've got to actually 
So my job as stakeholder is, is done once settlement has been effected and you have to, the agent has to deliver up that money to the seller within 14 days of a written request or within 42 days of becoming entitled. So once the seller is entitled to that money, automatically within 42 days, the real estate agent has to forward that money on. Otherwise, if the seller's keen and they want their money early, they make a written request and the agent has to respond within 14 days. So that is the issue of investment of the deposit. What happens in terms of solicitors? Well, the Trust Accounts Act doesn't apply to stakeholder money, to deposits. Um, nevertheless, it's going to be paid into your trust account, isn't it? So the Legal Profession Act will govern disbursement of money from that account. Um, you can see, as I say there on the slide, deposits going to be paid in connection with provision of legal services and dealt with as trust money. So at the end of the day, who gets it will depend on who's entitled to it and the solicitor will form an opinion one way or the other uh, who's entitled to that deposit money. It's going to have to give notice in writing to all parties as to its opinion on who's going to get that deposit money um, and it'll be paid on a certain day, at least 60 days after the notice, unless a proceeding is started disputing entitlement and the practice is advised before the stated date that the practice has said that it's going to pay out the money to the person it's, it considers that deserves that money, that is entitled to that money. So what happens in terms of a dispute? Um, if the law firm has already paid out the money on or after the date that they said that they were going to pay it out to the person they thought was entitled um, and they haven't received notice of proceedings being on foot to dispute entitlement, then obviously the law firm is not going to be liable to uh, refund or to recover the money in any way. Otherwise, the practice just simply keeps the money in their trust account pending resolution of the dispute between the parties or a court order telling them what to do with the deposit money. So that's the position of the solicitor and that is da -da -da, a week two real estate agents. As always, if you have any queries or questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email, shoot me a tweet, a Facebook post or contact me in Teams. It's a great place to catch up. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you in the Zoom tutorial for this week's material. Till then, bye for now guys.